Welcome back to my inner sanctum. I'm your hostess, Countess Elizabeth, Mistress of the Macabre. And today, we'll learn about a man who was truly lucky. Usually, we cover cases where people go missing while at sea. But this time, we will cover a man who is a real-life castaway. We will learn about the real-life story of someone who was rescued after being lost at sea for over a year. We will learn about the man, the legend, Jose Salvador Alvarenga, in his journey while he was hopelessly lost at sea for over 12 months. So let us get on our boat for that deep sea voyage so we can explore our grotesque curiosity. Jose Salvador Alvarenga was an experienced fisherman, well versed in the ways of the sea after years spent fishing commercially. But even the most experienced fishermen are no match for a tropical storm, especially when they're in a 15 foot skiff with no way to steer, no food, and a horribly inexperienced fishing mate. In late 2012, that is exactly where Alvarenga found himself for the next 438 days. From the moment it began, Jose Salvador Alvarenga's fishing trip seemed doomed. He had planned on taking a 30-hour deep-sea fishing shift, which would hopefully yield sharks, marlins, and sailfish. The three were particularly lucrative fish, and if plentiful enough, would lend him a hefty sum of money. In the fishing village of Costa Azul, Mexico, the competition was high and Alvarenga was hoping to bring back an impressive haul. Unfortunately, his fishing mate, a man named Ray Perez, another seaworthy fisherman who worked for the employer Willie Rodriguez, backed out at the last minute. Alvarenga, keen to get out at sea, arranged to go with Ezekiel Cordoba, otherwise known as Piñata, instead. He was a 22-year-old with little experience on a fishing boat. Alvarenga and Cordoba had never even spoken before, much less worked together. Alvarenga deemed the inexperienced young man fit for the journey nonetheless. After all, the trip was to be a short one, just over a day long, and they should be relatively close to the shore throughout. On November 17th, 2012, the pair set out on a 14-foot fiberglass skiff with a small motor on what was to be a 30-hour shift catching fish in the deep ocean. On board were various fishing tools, a portable electronic radio battery which was half charged, and a large ice box to hold the fish. The journey seemed like it would be bountiful, as Alvarenga hoped, and before long, the two had caught over a thousand pounds of fish almost overloading their ice box. But all was not well. A huge storm had been brewing in the ocean. Alvarenga tensely negotiated the skiff's slow advance towards the coast, but it was hard to see with the rain, maneuvering carefully among the waves. The storm had destroyed the motor and made the skiff blow off course. Alvarenga managed to use the radio to contact his boss to get some help. Willy, 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 the motor is ruined. Calm down, man. Give me your coordinates, Willie responded from the beachside docks of Costa Azul. We have no GPS. It's not functioning. Lay an anchor, Willie ordered. We have no anchor, Alvarenga said. He had noticed it was missing before setting off, but didn't think he needed it on such a short mission. Okay, we are coming to get you, Willie responded. Come on now. It's really getting messed up out here, Alvarenga shouted. Those were his final words to shore. As the waves sumped the boat, Alvarenga and Cordoba began working as a team. With the morning sun, they could see the waves approaching, rising high above them, and then splitting open. Each man would brace and lean against the side of the open hulled boat to counteract the roll. Alvarenga realized their catch, the nearly a thousand pounds of fresh fish, was making the boat top-heavy and unstable. With no time to consult his boss, Alvarenga went with his gut. They would dump all the fish. One by one, they hauled them out of the cooler, swinging the carcasses into the ocean. Falling overboard was now even more dangerous than ever. The bloody fish were sure to attract sharks. Next, they tossed the ice and the extra gasoline. Alvarenga strung 50 buoys from the boat as a makeshift sea anchor that floated on the surface, providing drag and some stability. But at around 10 a.m., the radio died. It was on day one of the storm that Alvarenga knew was likely to last five days. Losing the GPS had been an inconvenience. The failed motor was a disaster. Now without radio contact, they were on their own. The storm rolled the men all afternoon as they fought to bail water out of the boat. 
They had dumped perhaps half the water. They were both ready to faint with exhaustion. The sun sank, and the storm churned as Cordoba and Alvarenga succumbed to the cold. They turned the refrigerator-style icebox upside down and huddled inside for warmth, soaking wet and barely able to clench their cold hands into fists. They hugged and wrapped their legs around each other, but as the incoming water sank the boat even lower, the men took turns, leaving the icebox to bail water every 10 or 15 minutes. Progress was slow, but the pond at their feet gradually grew smaller. Darkness shrank their world as gale force winds ripped offshore and drove the men further out to sea. Were they now back to where they had been fishing a day earlier? Were they heading north towards Acapulco or south towards Panama? The stars were their only guides since they had lost the usual means to calculate distance. Without bait or fish hooks, Alvarenga invented a daring strategy to catch fish. He kneeled alongside the edge of the boat and shoved his arms into the water up to his shoulders. When a fish swam between his hands, he smashed them shut, digging his fingernails into the rough scales. Many had his escaped, but soon Alvarenga mastered the tactic and he began to grab the fish and toss them into the boat. With a fishing knife, Cordoba expertly cleaned and sliced the flesh into finger-sized strips and they were left to dry out in the sun. They ate fish after fish. Alvarenga stuffed raw meat and dried meat into his mouth, hardly noticing or caring about the difference. When they got lucky, they were able to catch turtles, and occasional flying fish landed inside their boat. So Alvarenga caught fish and turtles with his bare hands, which I think is actually pretty crazy that he got so good at it. I guess being an expert fisher, he knew how to get them easily. Within days, Alvarenga began to drink his urine and encouraged Cordoba to follow suit. It was salty, but not revolting as he drank, urinated, and then drank again, peed again in a cycle that felt as if it were providing at least minimal hydration. What they didn't know, in fact, was that it was exacerbating their dehydration, but Alvarenga had learned long ago the dangers of drinking the seawater. Despite their longing for liquid, they resisted swallowing even a cupful of the endless salt water that surrounded them. I was so hungry that I was eating my own fingernails, swallowing all the little pieces, Alvarenga later said. After roughly 14 days at sea, Alvarenga was resting inside the icebox when he heard the sound of raindrops. Piñata! 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 Oi! Alvarenga screamed to Cordoba as he slipped out. His crewmate awoke and joined him. Rushing along the deck, the two men deployed a rainwater collection system. Cordoba scrubbed a gray five-gallon bucket to collect the rainwater. Dark clouds stalked overhead, and after days of drinking urine and turtle blood and nearly dying of thirst, a storm finally bore down on the men. They opened their mouths to the falling rain, stripped off their clothes, and showered in a glorious deluge of fresh water. Within an hour, the buckets had an inch, then two inches of water. The men laughed and drank every couple of minutes, but then choosing to ration their water supplies. When they had several days worth of fish, and also a turtle, Cordoba and Alvarenga briefly found solace in the magnificent seascape. We would talk about our mothers, Alvarenga recalled, and how badly we behaved as children. After two months at sea, Alvarenga had become accustomed to capturing and eating birds and turtles, while Cordoba had become physically ill and had a mental decline. According to Alvarenga, Cordoba had been sick after eating raw seabirds and had made a drastic decision. He began to refuse all food. Alvarenga offered tiny chunks of bird meat, occasionally a bite of turtle. Cordoba clenched his mouth. His body was shutting down. This is when the two men made a pact. If Cordoba survived, he would travel to El Salvador and visit Alvarenga's mother and father. And if Alvarenga made it out alive, he'd go back to Chiapas, Mexico, and find Cordoba's devout mother and tell her what happened to her son. Cordoba said one morning, I'm dying. I'm dying. I am almost gone. Don't think about that. Let's take a nap. Alvarenga replied as he laid alongside Cordoba. I'm tired. I want water, Cordoba moaned. His breath was rough. Alvarenga retrieved a water bottle they found and put it in Cordoba's mouth, but he did not swallow. Instead, he stretched out. His body shook in short convulsions. He groaned and his body tensed up. Alvarenga suddenly panicked. He screamed into Cordoba's face. Don't leave me alone. You have to fight for life. What am I going to do here alone? Cordoba didn't reply. Moments later, he died with his eyes open. I propped him up to keep him out of the water. I was afraid a wave might wash him out of the boat, Alvarenga said. I cried for hours. The next morning, he stared at Cordoba in the bow of the boat. He asked the corpse, how do you feel? How was your sleep? 
Alvarenga soon realized he was actively talking to a corpse and felt his sanity slip day by day. Six days after Cordoba's death, Alvarenga sat with the corpse on a moonless night in full conversation when, as if waking from a dream, he suddenly was shocked to find he was conversing with the dead. First I washed his feet. His clothes were useful, so I stripped off a pair of shorts and sweatshirt. I put that on. It was red with little skull and crossbones, and then I dumped him in the water. And as I slid him into the water, I fainted. When he awoke just minutes later, Alvarenga was terrified. What could I do alone without anybody to speak with? Why had he died and not me? I had invited him to fish. I blamed myself for his death, but his will to live and fear of suicide kept him searching for solutions and scouring the ocean's surface for ships. Sunrise and sunset were best as blurry shapes on the horizon were transformed into neat little silhouettes and the sun was bearable. With his eyesight fine-tuned, Alvarenga could identify a tiny speck on the horizon as a ship. However, none of the ships stopped for the boat. As they could not see him, storms battered the small boat, but as he got farther out to sea, the storms seemed shorter, more manageable. Alvarenga let his imagination run wild in order to keep sane. He was mastering the art of turning solitude into a Fantasia-like world. He started his mornings with a long walk. I would stroll back and forth on the boat, and I would imagine I was wandering the world. By doing this, I could make believe that I was actually doing something, not just sitting here thinking about dying. When he was a small boy, his grandfather had taught him how to keep track of time using cycles of the moon. Now, alone, in the open ocean, he was always clear on how many months he had been adrift. He knew he had seen 15 lunar cycles while drifting through the unknown territory. He was convinced he was gonna die soon. He was whizzing along a smooth current when suddenly the sky filled with shorebirds. Alvarenga stared. A tropical island emerged from the mist, a green Pacific atoll, a small hill surrounded by a kaleidoscope of turquoise waters. The hallucinations usually didn't last this long. Had his prayers finally been answered? Alvarenga's racing mind imagined multiple disaster scenarios. He could be blown off course. He could drift back Words, it had happened before. He stared at the land as he tried to pick out details from the shore. It was a tiny island, no bigger than a football, soccer field. In an hour, he had drifted near the island's beach, ten yards from shore. Alvarenga dove into the water, then paddled like a turtle until a large wave picked him up and tossed him high onto the beach like driftwood. As the wave pulled away, Alvarenga was left face down on the sand. I held a handful of sand like it was a treasure. He was unable to stand for more than a few seconds. I was totally destroyed and as skinny as a board, he said. The only thing that left of my intestines and gut, plus skin and bones. My arms had no meat. My thighs were skinny and ugly. Although he didn't know it, Alvarenga had washed ashore on Tile Islet, a small island that is part of the Ebon Atoll in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, one of the most remote spots on Earth. As he had stumbled through the overgrowth, he suddenly found himself standing across a small canal from a beach house of Emi Libok Meto and her husband Russell. As I'm looking across, I see a white man standing there said Emi, who works husking and drying coconuts on the island. He is yelling. He looks weak and hungry. My first thought was, this person swam here. He must have fallen off of a ship. After tentatively approaching each other, Emi and Russell welcomed him into their home. However, Alvarenga only spoke Spanish, which the couple did not understand. He asked for medicine. ¿Tienes medicina? He asked for a doctor. Necesito un doctor, por favor. The native couple smiled kindly and they shook their head. They didn't understand him. After a morning of caring for and feeding the castaway, Russell sailed across a lagoon to the main town and port on the island Ebon to ask for help. Within hours, a group, including police and a nurse, had come to rescue Alvarenga. They had to persuade him to get on a boat with them back to Ebon. Can you blame Alvarenga for not wanting to go back on a boat after all of that? Alvarenga was seen by a doctor and his medical condition steadily worsened. But after 11 days, doctors did determined that Alvarenga's health had stabilized enough for him to travel home to El Salvador, where he would be reunited with his family. While some skeptics question parts of Alvarenga's story, they think that there's no way Alvarenga was out to sea for all over a year without getting scurvy. Experts weighed in, and turns out the meat from turtles contained vitamin C for Alvarenga to survive. Others are also skeptical with what really happened to Cordoba, aka Piñata. While some believe that Alvarenga ate his companion for food, 
food. Alvarenga fiercely denied these claims, as they had a pact that no one would eat each other. Alvarenga, a Salvadorian, returned to his family in El Salvador, who thought that he was dead and were shocked at his tale of survival. Here he is at a press conference as he was returned to El Salvador. He refuses to speak about the ordeal and just wants to move on with his life. Well, that was truly a grotesque tale. What I find most fascinating is that, is that this is the longest case of a man being found at sea, 438 days according to Alvarenga. I do think his tale is genuine. Poor Piñata. While there is skepticism around what really happened, either way it was tragic. May Cordoba's soul rest in peace. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe, like, and share if you would also like to keep exploring our grotesque curiosity. We will meet again in the darkness of the night.